Um, the final presentation on this panel, uh, after which we'll have some Q&A, is uh, by Bob Yalal and uh, Jericho Locke. Um, Dr. Lal is a research staff member at the IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute, or STBI, or STIPI, I understand it's STIPI. Yes. Um, her degrees include a, uh, P I can't list all the degrees, Bobby. Her <laughs> degrees include a PhD in public policy and public administration from George Washington University and in a master's in science in nuclear engineering from MIT. She has been at STIPI since 2005, where she leads studies for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, the National Space Council, and uh, other federal organizations, including NASA. She's joined by Jericho Locke, who was, a, I believe, a science policy fellow at uh, STIPI. He has a degree in mechanical engineering and applied mathematics from Lipscomb University. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. So I will get us started. I think, uh, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, so I think we had a really interesting morning. Jeff kind of started us by talking about the big picture, how NASA makes decisions, what are the criteria NASA, NASA has to go through. Jeff King talked about some of the you know penalties LEU systems might provide, and, and um, uh, Edwin talked about the proliferation issues. And the one takeaway for me here is that uh, this is actually a complex trade space, and we need to look at the criteria all together. And what we will be talking today about is what are those criteria and how we would go about uh, evaluating uh, HEU and LEU systems on those. Uh, before we get into the details, just a quick word on what STIPI is. We are a federally funded research and development center that uh, supports the White House. As Alan said, uh, we tend to be, uh, we, we uh, conduct data-driven, rigorous um, and empirical studies. We work primarily for the federal government, so we tend to have not any sort of dogs and fights. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to get us started with uh, our context. So Jericho, take it away. Thanks, Bobby. So um, we've talked, <coughs> had a couple references to the United States previous nuclear um, work in space, um, specifically the snap Tenet reactor flown in 1965 with highly enriched uranium. Most of the United States work in space is with radioisotope power systems powered by plutonium-238. I think it's just important to note that there's a lot more going on in space nuclear than these fission systems. Um, there is no U.S. policy a, to, describing the use of HEU in space reactors. Um, there's no, um, that, whether that's executive congressional currently, there's nothing directing NASA what type of enrichment levels they must use in their space reactors. Um, the only international or national document describing the enrichment levels is a UN document, the Res Resolution 4768, which actually directs for power systems that highly enriched uranium has to be used. Um, this was during a time where the trade-off was between uranium and plutonium. So some of the reasons were it prescribed HEU as, as, a, um, as, a, as an alternative to plutonium. But it's worth noting that HEU has been vetted on the international level and is actually directed to use on the legal side. Um, as Edwin and we've talked about, um, there is a there's a movement towards reducing the use of HEU and eliminating the use of HEU in civilian applications in the United States and internationally. This is typically <coughs> towards civilian research reactors, um, so test reactors at universities, um, medical isotope production. Um, for example, a 2016 study on the use of HEU talked about these types of research reactors, but specifically excluded propulsion reactors and space reactors in their study. Um, now we're talking about what to do in the future. Um, as Pavia mentioned, this is a fairly complex decision, especially for us as researchers, trying to understand all the factors that go into how do you, whether to use HU or LEU in a nuclear system. Um, it's not trivial and it's important to consider everything. Um, from our literature review on this, on this topic so far, um, there's been no studies that have considered all the dimensions for a specific system or for the wide range of systems under consideration um, for use in space. Um, but we're going to get into some of the criteria and dimensions that may be considered in a future decision. And it seems that uh, Jeff, uh, NASA, and DOE are starting uh, potentially such a study. Absolutely. So I listed up on this slide um, 
several different types of criteria that may be considered in any type of comprehensive trade study. I'm just walking through all of these. This is the performance. Um, this is how the reactor and the system actually performs in space. We've touched on the mass issue. That's obviously pretty critical when we're talking about whether they use HU or LU in these systems. The complexity of the system is also important, as Professor King touched on, um, whether you're moderating the system, whether you're using control drums, how you control the system has a huge effects on the R&D requirements for developing the systems and for their operability in space. Also the lifetime, how long these systems can actually operate. Um, there's also safety considerations when you're talking about HU and LU. Um, there's always a potential that there's a launch accident or the, if the reactor is being used in Earth <coughs> orbit that it re-enters Earth and has safety as radiological risks for humans or our environment. Um, so understanding how the decision affects these types of safety criteria is critical. Um, there's also obviously security concerns. Um, we've touched on these quite a bit, so I'm not going to delve into them too much more. But HU is a higher security risk, obviously proliferation, both of the threat of uh, someone taking this, taking the material itself, or the precedent that it sets internationally. Um, timeliness is also important. How fast can we get to a system that is actually usable in space, especially on ambitious timelines like we are today, going to the moon and beyond? Um, the cost is obviously also a critical factor. The cost of the reactor system itself, the fuel that's going to be um, powering it, security costs around the entire life cycle, everything else. There's also a number of other factors um, that are important, especially for us from a strategic national perspective, um, sustainability of the fuel line and of the um, reactor design line in general, um, applications to other markets, such as the terrestrial market, the HALU power market, for example, um, and the availability of our commercial partners to work with us in designing and building these systems. Um, going into some of these in a little bit more detail and applying them to HU and LU specifically. Um, so performance, we've already talked about mass a decent amount. Um, so typically you're going to see that LU systems have higher mass, um, sometimes by 200, 300%. Um, a kilopower trade study, I think this was for the space version of the reactor, showed that an LEU system for the one kilowatt would increase mass by 200% and the 10 kilowatt variant would increase by 75%. Um, this is obviously different when you're looking at higher power systems. At higher powers, um, you start to have other types of mass drivers such as the thermal, the power conversion system, shielding, um, thermal control that minimize the effects of more having more uranium fuel in the system. Um, uh, a corollary for this is that for smaller systems, HEU provides higher benefits for mass. This is especially relevant for the one kilowatt um, kilopower example that we've been looking at, um, looking at the critical mass of the fuel required. Um, you, HEU just provides an easier design space for lower power environments. Um, another important thing to point out here is the reliability and technical risk of these systems. Um, Jeffrey already pointed this out a little bit with looking at LEU systems. You can sometimes get similar performance characteristics, but often that comes at the cost of a clever design, more advanced materials, um, the oper operability of the reactor and other things um, that make it add technical risk to any type of program you're looking at. Um, another factor that's complexity is on safety. Um, so there have been some studies that show that it's more, more difficult to meet launch accidents with LEU systems, specifically criticality accidents. An example of this is a submersion accident. If you launch a reactor and it lands in the ocean, um, a moderator reactor, you're going to have much more problems with um, infinite reflection, um, having this go super critical, which is easier to meet with an HEU reactor, especially one that's unmoderated. Um, moving on to timeliness. Um, there's obviously a number of factors that we think of when we when we trade off LEU and HEU. Um, HEU systems are typically simpler, so they're easier to get to a performance-ready system quicker. This is especially the case now that um, kilopower has already been tested with HEU getting to a launch timeline soon. Um, it's easier for an HEU system. Um, the other side of this is that using <coughs> HEU requires more coordination time. Um, so that includes launch approval, coordinating with agency partners for security, our international partners explaining why we're doing this um, is an important factor. Um, overall, uh, you get to you have some benefits from the simpler systems. We also have some drawbacks from higher complexity and coordinating um, approvals and other part, things like that. Cost is obviously critical here as well. Um, the security costs are much talked about for HEU. Um, you're simply going to have to 
protect this material more as a DOE category one material as we should um, because of the security risks. Um, as NASA's, NASA's power assessment study showed that for a launch regime, for the first launch of kilopower would be about $70 million more. There's been some follow-ups to that, but you are looking at a significant cost increase through the life cycle of the system. There may be increases in the launch costs um, for, a, for an LEU system if it's higher mass. Um, so you're looking at increases in cost there, although those might not be the same level as security. Um, the, the certifications and also another important example to point out, and um, this is especially important for private entities interested in the use of um, nuclear systems supplying these systems. Um, if you look at NRC licenses, HEU requires a category one facility, which costs $100 million or more to license and build. Um, well, 19.75 enrichment, the often alternative to HU fuel is only a category two facility requiring less cost, less approval time for private entities to use. One thing I also wanted to touch on is um, there is an existing approval process for nuclear systems. Um, this is specifically launch approval. It's already been mentioned that there's a presidential memorandum on this that was re released as recently as August, this past August. Um, it sets up, it, it applies to all space nuclear systems. So whether you're using a radioisotope power system, an LEU fission system or an HU fission system, you have to go through some type of this process. There are three main tiers. Um, the fission systems in general fall into tier two, which requires interagency review, multiple levels of a safety review, um, systems with the potent that use a fuel other than LEU, for example, HEU, have to go through the tier three of approval, which adds presidential approval for the security risk for these systems. Um, that's important for some of the things I mentioned earlier, the timeline to the system, how you can get to approval, the cost of going through this process. But it's also important from a policy and management standpoint, especially from where we sit, that these security issues are already being considered at the highest levels for approving fission systems before they're launched. Um, not only the security of the system, but also because it's made by the White House, other factors will be considered as we make these decisions. In summary, um, as jumping back to where we started at the beginning, there's been a number of trade studies and technical analyses of the trade-offs between LEU and HEU. Um, that, that informed a number of the things that I talked about earlier in the trade space, um, but not, no one has yet considered all the issues, especially um, for one reactor system. Um, not all of these criteria that I'm talking about are equally important. If you can't meet the mission criteria, it doesn't really matter it's some of the other criteria we're talking about. You have to be able to perform in space. Um, the details obviously are also critically important for any type of analysis. Um, the trade-offs vary drastically based on the exact the design of the reactor and the complementary systems. Um, they also vary very heavily on the power levels. So for example, a good example of that is mass, mass sensitivity to power levels. Um, one thing to point out I think that's good to just reiterate is that it's much more difficult to engineer LEU systems, especially when you're trying to meet a similar type of mass profile as an HEU system. That inputs a lot of technical risk to any type of program, both in R&D and in the actual operation of the system in space. Um, that's important to consider as we move forward with thinking about the trade-offs between HEU and LEU. Um, also, many of the costs of the things that we might be concerned about with an HEU system, such as security concerns already baked into requirements for future NASA missions. Um, for example, the security costs, security of the system is obviously critically important. Um, and that's what one reason we have so many security costs associated with that to ensure that the material is effectively protected. Um, no worries. That's all that we have and look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you very, very much.